Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 22nd, 2015. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week. This week I mean it. I have uh, replenished my supply of Mountain Dew. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on the Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement. But PepsiCo, hey, you're out there. Let me shout out. I wonder if anybody else out there has an equally delicious and caffeinated drink. Feel free to give me a shout out. Red Bull sub is too fat. Hey, I'm working on that though. So you won't be able to call me Big Dave as, 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 anymore. <laughs> now I have a feeling that um, you will continue to be, I'll be Big Dave for a while. Uh, my screen's not being shown. Okay, let's do this. Okay. Oh, good stuff. All right. Enough of that nonsense. Let's take a look at the. Um, just make sure everybody's seeing the um, screen here. Okay, you see the screen? Okay. All right, fantastic. Okay, um, there's a disclaimer. As you know, if you've been trading for more than a day, you can lose money trading. Or, as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, do me a favor, throw me a bone. You read the book, you like the book? Blame this guy the trading stocks. Please uh, put me up a review on Amazon. The reason I ask is because occasionally you have a malignant person. Can you imagine hanging out with these type of people? They review the reviews. They don't even bother reading the book. They just review reviews. So it's, I can't imagine having that much time and being that malignant. But hey, I guess there's one in every bunch. Anyway, enough of that. What are we going to talk about? Well, one thing that has come up recently, especially with last week's talk about efficiency and inefficiency, is once you get an efficient, um, I'm sorry, once you get an inefficient move in a market, a couple things happen. You get your price expansion, but the volatility also expands. And I've lectured on this in the past where I've showed the volatility expanding with price. And if you trade properly, a lot of times this will happen. And I'm going to explain that in just one second. I have a so long and things for all a fish example, but it could also be a discretionary example too. So it's kind of fun that um, it, it's developing as we uh, as we speak. And I'm going to show you that. We'll take a look at the live chart too. Um, giving up open profits is hard for a lot of people, but it's vitally important for your longer term success. And we're going to touch upon that in a few minutes too. So let's just kind of jump right into it. Um, if you're trading properly, ideally what's going to happen is that the price is going to move in your direction and then the volatility is also going to jump too. Okay, And just on a point basis, the higher a stock gets, the more it can move around on a point basis. So if you're looking at your stop on a point basis, that's one way of looking at the fact that what you'll have to do in order to try to ride out these moves is let that stop widen out, okay? Just kind of gradually and naturally. And also what you're doing, and I've given this speech a thousand times, but you're transitioning from a swing trader to a position trader. And if you try to open up a position and give it enough room, for it to, to have a longer term trend, your stop will probably have to be way down here or somewhere and your risk are too large because if you get stopped out or let's say it does get way up here, you're still going to have to have just a tremendous amount of stops. So the, ideally, you want to let this stop slowly, gradually, slowly and gradually open up so that you can hopefully ride out these bigger picture corrections. But keep in mind that if you're doing it properly, your volatility is going to expand too. And that makes sense because you want to make money as fast as possible. In order for that to happen, the market's going to become more and more volatile. And if you notice these bars in here, the width of the bar begins to increase as that move becomes more and more favorable. Now, technically, this stock did stop out this morning 
at 66. And the reason I say technically it is because it's also a discretionary example. We'll get to that in just one second. This is a 50% move since November, late November or mid-November. Annualized, I think if I did my math correctly, that's, that's still 300% a year. So that's better than a poke in the eye. And then if you add in the first loaf where you make 1000 bucks to this, that's 3.75%. On a 100k model, which is what we're using for this, every time a new position is initiated, you can't see it, but we assume that you have 100k in the account. I do some other metrics where I do a quarterly compounding, and that that's that brings up some interesting results. But for tracking purposes, the portfolio is always going to have 100k in it, and that just makes the math easy. Okay, so here's the stop. It did nick the stop. It better than poke the eye again. Thirty-seven fifty on a one hundred k account. Again, see how easy it makes the math. Just move your decimal a couple of points, and then you got a three point seven five percent return. So it helps. And obviously, if you look at this number here, a thousand plus that thirty-seven fifty, that's a significant portion of the open portfolio. So you can see that winner does help out significantly. Now, what I want to talk about now is open profit drawdown. Somebody told me they sold out at 85, right around here, which is fantastic because they caught a ride from here to here, and that's just beautiful. And they avoided this drawdown here. Now, unfortunately, this stopped out, so it doesn't, technically, I can't make this a great example of micromanaging yourself out of a trade. But it did kind of nick the stop this morning, so you could still actually be with this trade so far. And we'll get to that in just one second. But a lot of times when people get into a favorable move, they look at how much they made and they can't stand it and they get out of the trade. Now I'm getting a little further ahead of myself, but if you get out right here, you're never going to make it to right here. And it'll be fun to watch this one as a discretionary type of trade. So, so far, it's still open on a discretionary basis to see if it does get up here somewhere or higher. Now, keep in mind that the market can be a bad teacher because if you don't sell out here, what happens? Well, it implodes. Okay? Usually, though, if you do sell out here, then you get the real move out and you miss it. Now, before I digress too far, let's get back to open profits. And I've talked of this quite often. Um, the only turtle book I've ever read was because I was at an AAPTA meeting once and they started talking about how um, the turtles got a ping pong table because it was so damn bored waiting for signals. And I just thought that was brilliant that they found a way to amuse and entertain themselves to a point where they got really good at it and they actually had tournaments and um, and that's all in the book, and that's fascinating. But anyway, someone was talking about that. I just thought it was pretty cool, so I decided to uh, to read the book. And, and to my surprise, there's a lot of good stuff in the book. You can't really trade like the turtles, at least not nowadays. And I think that um, not to take anything away from the turtles, I think they, but I think a little bit of of what they did was being in the right place at the right time. But here's the good news, and I don't want to digress too far, and I didn't even think I would, I would go off on this tangent, but hey, you know me, I go off on tangents. Um, at a uh, prior, uh, a meeting after that that say, that meeting, um, I learned about the, um, uh, uh, let me start over. At a meeting after that, uh, Ed Sakota spoke to us, and Ed was talking about bubbles and, and how the current environment with the government and everything, and he's not necessarily a pro of what's going on with the government. In fact, he kind of sees it as um, the government kind of taking over. Governorly, I think is his, uh, the name of his book, like the government's taking over things and all. But his reasoning is in that environment, you will have bubble after bubble after bubble. So maybe a longer-term, simple, trend-following breakout system might be the way to go. But I still think that you're better off with a, a money management and position management plan and 
setups such as pullbacks as opposed to breakouts. But the point is that the Turtles made a lot of money, but they also happen to be at the right place at the right time. Longer term trend following can be really tough, and that's why I take the hybrid approach to it, meaning that I take a hybrid approach in that I'm looking to have both short term and longer term gains, and I'm also scaling out. Because if you just go in and try to get that longer term trend, like I talked about earlier, you're going to have to use a really wide stop. But you could, you could certainly get in as a short term trader because you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets, right? But you can get in as a short term trader and slowly let that stop loosen up and also scale out along the way. And I know I beat the dead horse on this, but there are times when I think that you know, maybe my stuff is too simple. Maybe I should be doing something more complex. And I get on these projects with these um, rich and famous people that many of you already probably know of, these names you've heard of. And I feel like, how am I going to impress these guys? And I was like, well, you know what? I'm just going to do what I do and the way I do it. And to my surprise, on more than one occasion, they've been like, you know, I really like this way you've scaled out of these positions and why you're stopped and rolled out these longer term trends. I never thought of that. And that's been kind of a epiphany for me. Um, it, if you've been trading for a while, you'll probably know that it can be a little lonely as a business. It's an awesome business, and I love what I do. And then I love the educational standpoint, too. I guess I'm a bit of a ham, and I've always liked to, to teach. Um, and I think it's a great way to also learn is by teaching, too. But in doing this, you'll find that sometimes you wonder if you're doing the right thing. I mean, obviously, if your bottom line is increasing, you feel pretty good about it. But when you hit these drawdowns and all, you question yourself. You question your methodology. You question what you're doing. And you wonder if you're doing the right thing. And that's just human nature. That's that's pretty normal. But in that soul searching, it's like, geez, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on these projects with these people. And it's like, how am I going to impress them? And it's like, you know what? I'm not going to try to impress. I'm just going to do what I do. And on one of the projects, I sat on my hands for three months. And they probably thought they'd never hear from me. And all of a sudden, I started putting in trades. And it worked out really well because I was very, very patient. And I just said, well, I'm not going to make a trade unless there is a trade. In fact, the, the leader of the project told me, don't invent trades. Because I told him, I said, I'm not your guy because I'm not going to be putting in trades every day. So anyway, before I digress too far, you have to get your head wrapped around open profits. And one of the hardest things to do for a lot of people is to, to give up some of those open profits. All right, Robin, we'll get to that. There's, 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 there's a big distinction on, on, on I know, it's, it's kind of dangerous territory, but we'll get to that. Uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between giving up open profits and losses, okay? You have to be willing to give up some of the open profits, and that's kind of the tough part of this game. And as uh, Curtis Faith said, and the book is, uh, by the way, is The Way of the Turtle. And I was just flipping through it this morning, and I, I see that I've, I've highlighted quite a few things in here that I found very interesting. Not that I would trade like this, but a lot of their philosophy and all is pretty darn good. So I would recommend you read the book. It's it's not that much. Um Pick it up. You could probably find. I think it's on my website somewhere, or uh, just punch it in. Way of the turtle. Punch it in on the Amazon little um, link on my site. I'll get fifty cents, and then I'll put that towards. I'll either throw it at a plate or I'll put it towards my webinar fees. Uh, anyway, before I digress too far, he said, "As turtles, we were lucky since our boss, Richard Dennis, did not look at drawdowns that happened as a result of giving back profits in the same way that he looked at drawdowns that happened because." of a string of losses. He knew that giving back part of the profits was part of the game for trend followers. And you have to wrap your head around the methodology. Okay? 
And it could be any methodology, it doesn't matter. But if you know that a methodology has certain characteristics, I was talking with a with an old friend of mine, I got reacquainted with him yesterday, and we were talking about options. Um, and if you're shorting options or selling options, sooner or later you're going to get whacked. That I can guarantee. But if you can wrap your head around that and live with it, then I would suggest you don't do it, but then you understand that that danger comes with a territory. As a longer-term trend follower, you will have these big drawdowns. Now, the way I compensate, again, is to scale out, and then to hopefully stay with that trend is to give the position room to brief. Um, a string of losses, you may be doing something wrong. You may not, okay? But sometimes maybe your stock selection could be a little bit better. Um, there are very simple things you could do to improve your stock selection, such as making sure the stock trades cleanly, keeping an eye out for overhead supply that might cap your trade, and things like that. Most, I'd say, not most of them, but a lot of those things, uh, if you look on my website, if you dig around, there's a one-hour video, or go to my YouTube channel to find it. But there's an introductory to stock selection, and a lot of those things are actually in that course. The whole stock selection course was 14 hours, but the first hour or so that I put up on YouTube is, is uh, covers a lot of that, so at the least, make sure you watch that. So that's the that comes with the string of losses. So you might be doing something wrong if you have a string of losses or an excessive string of losses. But it's okay to give up some of the open profits, and that just comes to the territory. Frenchie says, have it on the shelf but have not read it yet. Well, Pick it up and read it after this webinar. Put it, uh, put it in your bathroom. <laughs> um, now, here's the thing. It would be nice to – be. this is a story I've, I've told before, but I know I kind of repeat a lot of this stuff. But years ago, I was on uh, Prodigy. I think that was back before we had the Internet officially and bulletin boards and things like that. And I was talking stocks with this one guy, and I was a little bit younger at the time and a little bit more impressionable. And there was a gentleman on there, and he kept pumping this stock over and over and over again, and I kept buying it up like an idiot. And one day the stock got whacked pretty hard. And so we had become friendly, and he was an older gentleman, and – I'll never forget what he said. He goes, David, no one rings a bell for us when the market has topped. And it's like, it was a very painful lesson. So, but that's true. So we never know when a market has truly topped. And you have to remember that. And if you quit at 50%, you're never going to make 100%. And if you quit at 100%, you never make 200%. And if you quit at 200%, you never make 600% or 1,000% or 2,000%. So big outliers are always key, okay? And I think that's what separates the wheat from the chaff. You can make money swing trading, okay? And you can make money with this swing to intermediate term trading like I'm doing. And do okay if you're cashing out and taking profits somewhere along the line. But the real money, the juice, remember the old SNL skit? The juice, you like it, the juice, you want the juice? They, it was a Greek restaurant that had really good juice. And they would give you the juice with your, with your Greek sandwich, you know. Oh, the juice is good. Um, stupid skit, not that funny, but the juice is in the outliers and catching those occasional outliers. And that's why I'm always like, I'd rather be right, I'm sorry, I'd rather make money to be right. And you'd be surprised at how many people are just the opposite. And, and, and might not even realize it. Um, I think we got five out of five winners in the portfolio right now. I'd rather have one huge winner and four mediocre trades or four, you know, not that I want losing trades, but I'd rather have more money on the bottom line than more winners. And hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so big outliers are still key, and, and that's where the real juice is with this methodology or any trend-following methodology, okay? 
And that that that's the tough part for a lot of people. I don't want to make it sound like it's it's too elusive because these witters they they seem to come along just about at the right time and just about enough. It's like you never could get it's like it's never enough, but it's like they come around just about the time you need them. And staying in the game long enough until you get to those outliers is key. Now, you got to see things on a net net basis. You can't see things on a shoulda coulda woulda basis. You need to look at the closed out trade and you need to look at where you started and where you finished. Well, if you made 50% on a trade, $3,000, $4,000, whatever it is on a on a 100k account, that's that's decent money. It's better than a poke in the eye, okay? So Look at it on a net-net basis, and not a coulda, woulda, shoulda, what if basis. And this is where that, David, no one rings a bell for us when a market is topped. Okay? Now, you might be asking yourself, and this does come up quite often, what about maximum favorable excursion, MFE, in system terms? Now, MFE in system terms, if you run a system, and it makes, let's say it makes on average a 1000 bucks. And occasionally it might make 2000 but rarely does it ever make more than 2000 okay? Well, according to system design and system programming, you would take that MFE and say, well, this is about the most we ever get out of this ever. So I'm going to take that, I've got a $2,000 profit, I'm going to take that $2,000 profit and pat myself on the back because it rarely, if ever, goes any further than $2,000. And that's fine, and maybe that works with a short-term system. But when you start looking at MFE and things, odd things of that nature, anybody remember that? <laughs> My old Henry Kissinger imitations. When you start looking at the MFE, and other things like that. What are you do? What you're doing is you're looking at statistics, and when you start looking at statistics, that means you're seeing the markets as being normally distributed, okay? And statistics works great as long as things are normally distributed, okay? But markets are not. I went to the Mississippi Coast last weekend, um, did a little gambling. You know, I knew the odds were against me, but it's kind of entertainment, and, and, you know, they did win. But casinos, no, and I look at the size of the casinos and, and the opulence, you know, the granite everywhere and, and, and such, and I know that, that it's my money paying for that, but it's entertainment. It's something to do every now and then. We go maybe once a year. If I'm not speaking at Traders Expo in Vegas, we kind of – get the itch and go get rid of some of that troublesome cash. But that casino, or those casinos, are a multi-trillion with a T dollar business. And their edge, depending on the game, but their edge in a lot of times is very, very minuscule. But they know that they're going to have that edge statistically. And in the end, they will win. It is a fact. It is an absolute fact. They might have a bad streak, and streaks are very possible within statistics, okay? But they know that longer term, they're going to win in the end because it's normally distributed. So you got to be careful when you're looking at these things like MFE because markets aren't normally distributed, okay? Why am I listening to a guy who loses at the casino? Well... <laughs> How do you win in a casino? You can't, you know? Maybe every now and then. Oh, I'm talking nickels and dimes. I'm not talking real money. Um, because I'm not stupid. I mean, I know better. Um, now, keep in mind, again, you know, not to beat the dead horse and to ring the bell at the top, you're never going to get the top tick uh, when it comes to stocks or any markets. Maybe once in your career you'll get lucky. But 90% of the rest, the rest of the time you're going to – cash out thinking that you got the maximum favorable excursion or the most you're ever going to get out of the trade, and then guess what? You'll watch in anguish as that market doubles or triples or quadruples from there.
Okay. I wouldn't believe you said you were always winning. No, you can't. The odds are obviously stacked against you. Um, but it's it's fun. I mean, it's just you know the crafts is kind of fun because it it it, it has these streaks in it, and I would want to call I wouldn't call it trend following, but the streaks are kind of fun. And you know, I mean, I'm I'm on a three dollar table, so I'm not you know <laughs> I'm not I'm not betting the form. I know the odds are against me. It's just kind of fun. Uh, pretty girl brings you drinks, you know. I had pretty girl my arm, my wife, you know. So it's it's kind of fun. Uh, you can't monetize open profits. You can't. Look, yeah, I'm a low roller. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you can't monetize your open profits. You can't look at a, a stock as it's hitting those highs and getting a little stretched out there and say, I could sell that stock and buy a car or a boat or whatever. You, you just can't do that because as soon as you do – then you start stressing out when all of a sudden that stock starts going down. It's like, oh well, now I can't, now I can't buy the car, or I can't do this, or whatever. Um, or you, it's just you can't monetize it and think about it. You just have to look at the the where it is and where your stop is, and don't do that math in your head, and don't take that amount of money that that open drawdown that you could experience. And worry about it too much, okay? Don't throw caution to the wind. Do have a stop in place. But don't freak out if the market gives up some of those open profits and comes down. Now, again, scaling out can make all the difference in the world. So uh, Mr. Fate talked about, went on to talk about some horrendous drawdowns, which I would just consider blowing up. So you can't, you can't stomach that kind of, you know, the drawdowns. He's, he's talking about drawdowns up to 70%. I don't know how you can stomach that. And, and I, don't, I don't think you could even call it a drawdown. I guess if you, if you made all the money back and then some, you could. But uh, I'm not sure who could live through that. But scaling out does really help to mitigate the drawdowns because you're only giving up half as much as what you normally would have. Now, it would be nice to have that big profit to begin with. But you do need to scale out to help mitigate those big swings. Not everyone in this industry is going to agree with me on that. But I can assure you that if they don't scale out, their drawdowns are going to be much, much, much bigger. You might make more money, but eventually you're going to have a such a sizable drawdown that it's going to be very hard, if not impossible to recover from that. So I'm a big fan of scaling out. It's not by way of the highway. Do what you want, okay? Now let's talk about uh, a stop nick in here. Now Robert says, Dave, you seem to be waffling danger in dangerous territory against your maximum of honor your stops. Okay. Yes, you have to honor your stops. But if you have a stop, and a stock just kind of comes down and nicks that stop. Now, this isn't a perfect example, okay? But the volatility, as we said earlier, has gone somewhat extreme. You're approaching about 100 in here. And once you get over 100, things can get a little squirrely, okay? Longer term, though, if you look at this stock, it still looks like it's in a trend. It's so far, it only appears to be correct. Well, we didn't know it was going to correct that much, and we had to stop. We trailed that stop up, and it's about right here, okay? But so far, it just kind of nicked it, and so far, it's traded above it. So what do you do? Well, you can stay with the position. Don't throw caution to the wind. That doesn't mean that you say, well, I'm going to see if it comes back, 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 and then you wait out here somewhere. You set an alarm at or near your stop, and then you know that you might have to take some action. If that market finds it slow during the day, and it's not too far below your stop, now this is a point or two below, but this is a, this was an $80, $90 stock with an HV approaching 100, so a point or two means nothing, okay? Now, don't let it go. Ten points extra against you, but a point or two, you can survive, and I hate to say it with bad English, but it ain't going to kill you is a way to look at it, okay? So you make 
$2,500 instead of $2,700 or whatever. So it's okay to give them a little bit of wiggle room with the, with the and I hate to use the word hope, but with the hopes that they'll turn around and head right back up, okay? So that's okay. Now, I'm not going to go into a long lecture on discretion because we've talked about it plenty of times, and I'll wait until we have a lot more better examples to go off of. But if you are to exercise the discretion, it does take discipline, okay? If you're not disciplined, put in a real stop and forget about it and let the market take you out. In this particular case, it takes you out at a 50% profit. Again, that's better than poking the eye. I, I, you know, if I made 50% on every trade, you might not see my fat ass again, you know? Or I'd come back and taunt you every now and then. I'd taunt you a second time, okay? But it's okay to give them a little bit of rigor room, and a little being the key word in that sentence. Just have an uncle point in mind. When you came into the today, and I warned everyone last night in the service, I said, hey, we're really close to the stop. That's where the market closed. This is where the stop is, okay? Notice that we had a little opening gap reversal here, which straight back up. It could have easily done that this morning, but it just came down, kind of nicked it, nicked it a little bit more than nick, and then it's bounced a little bit off of it. So it's okay to stick with a position when it comes to uh, give it a little bit of extra wiggle room, okay? Now, we've got some questions coming in. But you obsessed over where to put your stop, and therefore now you let it go, maintain the peace of mind, right? But you obsessed over where to put the stop. Now, I never obsessed over where to put the stop. What I did was I slowly let this open up, okay? And the way I did that was, let's say this day here goes up, okay? Well, if it goes up by by X, maybe I just put I just raised my stop a little bit less than X, okay? In other words, let's say it goes up uh, 250, okay? Well, maybe I'll raise my stop two points, okay? So 250 minus two equals what? 50 cents? If I did my math right. Well, now my stop has widened by 50 cents, okay? And if I keep doing that. Because remember, the volatility is increasing, the price is increasing, the amount of points that the stock can move is increasing, and the amount of percent too. And also, I want to be in the stock a long, long time. I want to be able to ride out these fairly serious corrections. We knew it was coming, we just didn't know when, okay? So I'm willing to widen that stop out. So I didn't obsess over the stop, I just let it widen out, okay? One should be scalping if the written plan says hold till stop is hit. Two types of trading, wealth built a longer term, like trend trading or income producing frequent constant ringing of the register, frequent trades. What does your plan say? Well, the plan says that we want to be in a stock for a minimum 10 years, okay? No, scratch that out, 20 years, okay? Every trade we want to be in for 20 years, okay? Now, when do we get stopped out? Somewhere within a few days to a few weeks to a few months. And rarely, of course, we don't go 10 years, but every now and then we'll go, we might have wanted to go two years. Okay, that's happened. So you want to you want to position yourself for both a short-term gain and a longer-term gain. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's a way to have your cake and eat it, too. It took me a long time to reach this point, okay? It works for me. It doesn't mean that it's my way or the highway. There's other, there's more than one way to skin a cat, okay? But you have to find out what works for you. Now, the beauty of this is, although we did have a little bit of a dead money in here because it didn't, it didn't go take off right away, but I got a fairly short-term profit out of it, and I got a decent longer-term profit out of it, uh, too. So it's kind of like have your cake and eat it, too. You got a short-term quick profit. And then you also got a longer term profit on it, okay? So it's kind of like swing to intermediate. You swing, you take a swing at it, and you try. You're not swinging for the fences, okay? You're not trying to make a home run. You're just taking that, well, I know I've got a pretty good opportunity here. It looks pretty good short term. Looks like it might have some potential longer term, but I don't know that for a fact. So I'm going to scale out of a little bit, and then I'm going to keep a piece and possibly ride out. 
position trading for long term. <clears throat> yeah. You, you obsess to make a good decision about where you stop and then stick with it and not second guess it. Yeah, I'm not saying second guess your stop. This is where the stop is. It is what it is. Okay? But if it just kind of dips below it, this is not a perfect example because it did go a little bit below it. But like a while back, I gave a, a really good example. I think it was like an SCTY, one of my clients. We had a stop. I think it was about 16, okay? And he said, well, it's kind of coming down here. It's getting pretty close to the stop. It kind of looked like this. He goes, I'm going to give it 50 cents, okay? Now, don't give it don't give it six points or seven points or eight points. But if it's pretty close to the stop, you're coming in today, you know it's probably going to get hit on the open. You know, have some kind of plan in place. Well, I'll give it 50 cents. And he gave it 50 cents, and then he stuck with the profit, and it, it stuck with the stock, and it doubled from there. Now, what if you lose that 50 cents? So what? You lose 50 cents, okay? If it goes up 10 points, you could do you could exercise discretion 20 more times at 50 cents a pop. What does a trader need to do in order to find out what works for him? Spend a couple of hundred thousand dollars trading different methods, and then once you run out of money, then figure out what you want to do. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm half kidding. Uh, that's that's the hard part is it can be very expensive trying to find your way okay um if you you know you could you could go out and sell options and the problem with that is it might work for a year or two i have people email me hey i made a fortune last year i'm like okay well see if you could do it again this year the next year the year after and and i've yet to hear back from one of these people. Why? Well, because it blew up. Okay? So that's the hard part is knowing what system is right for you and not blowing up in the meantime and drinking your own Kool-Aid. Okay? But if you study enough markets, you begin to learn. And it does take school of hard knocks. It does take some experience. But if you study markets and you realize that they can make these huge moves, you certainly don't want to be short options as a way. Uh, short options is, is a wonderful way to have a very brief but brilliant career. And trust me, I have more experience here than you want to know. And maybe if we have a, you know, well, let's have a beer one night and I'll tell you all about shorting options, okay? Um, laugh to keep from crying. So you're going to have to go out and experience some of this stuff on your own. There's nothing I could say, but just kind of figure out what works for you by studying different methodologies. Maybe paper trade something until it makes sense. Uh, my hardest part is trying to keep people in the game and not going off to chase rainbows because the market starts chopping sideways and I'm not recommending much to do because there's nothing to do. And then they quit and go off to chase rainbows. Well, guess what? As soon as they do, what happens? The market begins trending again, and they end up perpetually out of phase. So I'm not going to tell you it's easy. I can tell you flat out. Just pick something really simple. I'll get you know, pick like trade persistent pullbacks. And only trade persistent pullbacks until you become successful doing that. If you're not successful with one pattern, you're not going to be successful with 10. So just take your time, study a few different things, and we all have a, a temptation to, to look at the good but not the bad. And I'm a towards person. There's a way, there's a way personalities that is toward personalities. I'm sort of toward, I'm kind of positive, I'm kind of energetic. And then there's a way personalities that are like more, cautious, what could go wrong, and, and, and you know, the world needs both types of people, okay, but if you're, when you're looking at these systems, a lot of times you tend to have this towards personality because you're focused on the goal, you're focused on the money you can make, but a lot of times you forget to focus on what you could lose. So you need to have a little bit of that away personality. At least you need to force yourself to look at the possibility of what could go wrong. Okay.
That's the best advice I've ever heard. I'm not sure what that what, – what, what, I wasn't watching the questions come in when I said it, okay? I have succeeded in buying the top tick several times. Yeah, yeah we all have a T-shirt for that. It's like we all have to do a few of those things uh, uh, to get um, – to get the T-shirt. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting, though, uh, that's funny. I, I know you're making a joke, or you probably have. Actually. But what's kind of interesting is a lot of times with a market, uh, if you get a new high in expansion of range, like we have here and like we had here, uh, sometimes that market can go on, as you can see from here to here, to make a significant move. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy a new high in expansion of range, but that's exactly what I do with the momentum list that I track, and that's kind of fun to, to do that. I'm not sure you could actually trade like that, but I'm, I put these stocks, I call it my Landry 100, and those stocks will go in when they're making that new high on expansion of range, and a lot of times you'll get some pretty nice follow-through, but yeah, absolutely, a lot of times you'll end up with the top tick, so you've got to be really careful. I've never met a rich pessimist. Well, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out, okay? Uh, stopped on a kite. Where would a reentry point be if it stays within range set today? Well, the problem with, with the the problem now with kite, and if you go back and watch last week's webinar, which is actually out there on, uh, I went ahead and put it on YouTube. Uh, one of the things I talked about when I was talking about efficient moves and inefficient moves and and, and all of these things is that uh, it is. I think I actually used kite. I said, well, this stock made an inefficient move by pretty much doubling in value, okay? So the fact that it doubled in value in the past suggests that it might have the potential to double in value in the future, okay? And the volatility was reasonably high based on, on this action here. So this is why I thought it was a good candidate back here. Now, the other thing that I showed was I showed a stock that went up like two or three hundred percent and made a very inefficient move from a, an IPO breakout pattern that we talked about in the uh, that I showed in the IPO course. So the problem with that is the volatility begins to jump and it becomes a little extreme. So it becomes a little bit too extreme. Now, in this particular case, this isn't the best example in the world, but the other one that I showed last week, the volatility went from like uh, below 100 to like 150 overnight because the stock went up 200%. Well, once stock makes that big of a move, it becomes a little bit too volatile to trade. It's almost too much of a good thing. So I would pass on this stock now because I think it's become a little too volatile, but I can't argue with the fact that it still looks pretty good. The problem now is your entry would probably be, you want to have a fairly liberal entry, probably about right here. And then you might have to have a, a stop at least about right here. And I'm just eyeballing it. So you're looking at at least about 20 points, okay, plus on that. And I think it's just to a point where it's too volatile to go after it. Now, now if you're already in it, open profits, different story, okay. Why do you change a trigger to a TKO? Why do you change a trigger to a TKO? Um, if you're talking about on the service, there's a stock that's a TKO. What I do is if you have a TKO or any other pullback type pattern, like this would be a textbook entry on a pullback, but we actually got it about right here. What I'm doing is I'm giving it a little bit of room. Now, if you have a stock that that forms a TKO and it closes right here, way down here, then maybe you could put the entry right above the high. Um, if you have the PDF of my second book, I have a What's Changed article that's in the front of it. If you want the article, if you don't have my second book, then, then why don't you? But... Uh, if you want the PDF of the What's Changed article, that's one of the things I said was back in the day, back in 2000, early 2000 and late 1999 or 1999 for the most part, you could get in right above that high and you were foolish not to get in right above that high. But now sometimes 
if you give things a little bit more wiggle room, okay, let's say your entry would be here. A lot of times you give them a little bit of wiggle room, let's say you want to enter here instead, they'll rally up and they'll stall out long before it ever hits that entry. And you'll save yourself a, um, a losing trade, okay? Would you consider scaling out with partial profits a second time, selling 25%? No, I've, I've kind of experimented with all of that type of stuff in the past, and it just seems like 50% seems, seems like the sweet spot. Um, if you scale out another 25%, I mean, unless you have an extreme move, like we had a stock a while back, and it, 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 was, a, it was a short – and it halved overnight, okay? It went down 50% overnight. And obviously, a short could only go to zero. So I recommended scaling out of some more shares. But as a general statement, you want to have enough on, and it's kind of a Goldilocks type of thing, but you want to have enough shares still on to where you could still make a significant amount of money on that second loaf. You want to be able to ride out that move that 600% move, that's going to put that one stock alone will, will give you a 30% or 40% move over a year's time in your overall portfolio, that big winner, okay? Now, that does create some big open drawdowns, like we just said, of open profits. So what? By the end of the year, you're making uh, decent money. Okay, he said, I'm talking to extreme move here. Okay, well... I hear you, and yeah, that's okay. Uh, what you might consider doing, and this is something that I've never really said publicly. I've talked to a few people I've mentored, and it's such a good problem to have. It doesn't happen that much. But if a market did take off and go straight up, and you just had a tremendous amount of profit in it, and it was optionable, you know it's going to have that, that, that deep retracement. Now, we know it's going to retrace, and we kind of grit our teeth. We don't know where it's going to have teeth. We don't know if it's going to happen here or here or here or here, you know, but we know when things start stretching out a little bit, when that rubber band gets stretched, we know that it's coming. But we don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, the thing could go another 20, 30, 40, 50 points or more before it actually happens. But if, yes, if you have something that's moved to extreme level, what you might do is you might sell out and this is going to complicate things, but you might buy some out-of-the-money options. And they're going to be expensive, so don't, don't waste too much money. But say, okay, well, I know this thing could draw it out to maybe like right here at least. So you might just say, well, what's from here to here, whatever this about is, and fritter away that amount of money. So if you sell out here and then you buy some options, giving up, I don't know. Let's say you got 100 points at a trade, kind of an extreme example. But let's say you give up 10 points of that to buy some options because you know it's going to going to correct anyway. So if the market corrects and the options are worthless and it turns out to be the top tick, then you made you made 90 points on the trade, okay? Now, let's say you get out and you wasted that 10 bucks. I say wasted because more often than not, it's probably going to expire worthless. But then let's say this stock does double overnight or something crazy happens, and there was a reason why it went from here to here because some insiders knew that they were going to get approval on some drug that's going to cure, I don't know, it's going to cure drawdowns. How's that? <laughs> uh and the stock doubles overnight, well, then you've got a huge windfall in the options, okay, and you made a fortune on the trade based on that cashing out and the options. Now, that's that's a little bit more advanced, and guess what's going to happen? It, 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 it's already happening. Somebody's um, Somebody said, I'd buy a straddle. Okay, well, here's the problem, and that's the problem with options. As soon as you open up that options can of worms, you know, <laughs> you're going to end up with more and more moving parts. And that's why that's why I try to avoid it publicly like the plague. And if I'm working with someone one-on-one, -on -one, we'll, we'll, uh, 
I'll be happy to 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 broach the subject. But but you're right. You know, maybe this. Okay, I hear you. Maybe you want to do a straddle or something. I don't know. I don't know about that. Why would you want to do a straddle? It's like, well, okay, well, let's start buying some puts. Well, what if you're buying puts and you're keeping the position, and then before you know it, you end up with some kind of synthetic position, and it just gets more and more and more complicated. Now, keep in mind, this is all a good problem to have. So, but it's not going to happen that often. But I would be I'd just be real careful. If you start uh, ending up with too many uh, moving parts, I would take 10 points and buy straddles instead. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, you got to be, you know, now you're, what you need straddle, you know, now it's getting complicated. Now you got puts, now you got calls. You, know, you did have a directional play, and what what's going to happen now? And, and you end up with a lot of moving parts really quick. I mean, that's what I was trying to tell my buddy yesterday. It's like, you know, we were talking about options. I was trying to explain to him, and and he, he hadn't fully wrapped his head around why is the option uh, losing so much value. It's like, well, you got nonlinear de decay last 30 days. You got gamma, delta, and intrinsic, extrinsic, and fluff, and and it's just a. It gets really. If you're an engineering type and you really enjoy that 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 working with these formulas and all this stuff and everything and modeling. And then it tends to work well, but I would prefer to keep it simple. Okay. Okay. Uh, Phil says kites retracement is more than three ATRs from the peak. As you say, it's gotten too volatile. Yeah. Well, it depends on what ATR. I mean, that's the problem with ATRs is like what H ATR are you looking at? You know. But yeah, I hear you. No, see, this is where options, you can see, this is where I, I, I made the mistake, and I said the options word, and <laughs> the, the can of worms got open, okay? Shay says, are you talking about selling naked options? No, I traded option spreads for a while. Yeah, um, even option spreads can be uh, kind of crazy and dangerous, but no, uh, never sell naked options, so you end up naked. Someday again, that's what I was saying earlier. That's that's a way to have a very brief but brilliant career on Wall Street. John says your entries have become more liberal over the years. Yes, is it fair to state that you base your entry on volatility of the stock more now than in the past? Probably uh, more like as you would set a stop. Yes, thank you for answering the questions. Uh, great show. Uh, yeah, John, uh, that's that's one of the reasons. Uh, markets have become a little bit more choppier in more recent times. Now, keep in mind, I'm comparing, I guess, the last 15 years to a few great years that we had in the late 90s, okay? And once you have a big bear market, I've learned painfully, is that markets do kind of tend to be a little bit more choppier after a big uh, bear market. And we've had a couple of bear markets since uh, since 2000, obviously one in 2000, one in 2007, obviously. So yeah, it's it's you're looking at the volatility of the stock, and you want to make sure it, you know it's a, it's a complex world out there, and the market maker knows that people who are following Dave Landry one on one are looking at a pullback, and where do you get in a pullback? Enter a pullback right above that high, so they know. Hey, if I could push that market above that high what's going to happen just like when they're on a stop hunt okay so they know and trust me you know he's got to feed his family too so no problem okay so you got to pull back that market maker knows he's not stupid okay he knows that if he can push that market higher it's going to rally up an extra point or so or two, and he could sell it right here because everybody and their brother is going to see that trigger in that pullback. So he could he could make this really quick, sell the stuffing out of it, and then the stock implodes. Okay, what was the um, who was the guy? Was it Damon Wayans or whatever? Homie, don't play that game, okay? So what I ought to do is hopefully I want to be right here. And if this fun and games happens, you know, 
I'm glad this guy's out there feeding his family, but he's not going to take my effing money anymore <laughs> because I've been earning right that high. Yeah, I was entering right that high back in 99 because that's the kind of market we were in. In fact, I was entering early. I was entering to get your day. And that's fine if you're in a rip-roaring up market. But anything less than that, you want to give some positions a little room. And this is something that I am very proud of sometimes when it comes to the service. We'll miss trade after trade after trade. Now, you know, you look at your bottom line, and your bottom line, you know, here's your equity curve. Well, it's not doing anything, so I don't get any credit for that. But if you miss several trades in less than ideal conditions, at least your equity curve is not doing this. And what people fail to realize is not only do you have to, you have to make back all of this in order to get back to here, okay? Surviving and mitigating drawdowns is key. So by avoiding as many losing trades as possible, you remain at higher levels with your equity curve, and you avoid having to worry about making back all of this. Now remember, if you lose 10% of your money, how much do you have to make back to get the break even? 11.1%. Okay? So you obviously have to make back more than you lost. If you lose 50% of your money, how much you have to make back? 100%. Okay? So the further you dip below zero, the harder it is to get back up. So the more trades you can miss by a liberal entry, and here's the missing piece, and I was telling my buddy this yesterday too, this is the missing piece. Stock selection is key. You want to be in the best of the best stocks. You want to be in stocks that trade cleanly. They don't have overhead resistance. They tend to go up day after day. They tend to be inefficient. Okay. If someone feels they must hedge, ETFs could be a better way to, to go to the options. Well, it depends. It could get pretty complex with ETFs too. The problem with uh, any type of hedge is hedging Hedging sounds great on paper, but in reality, it doesn't work that well, okay? Hedging is incredibly expensive. So if you try to hedge something, and I know we need to jump out to the charts, but you guys are giving me some great questions today and some, uh, some, some good fodder for debate. Um... Something I hate about that. I lose my screen. If you try to hedge, let's say you're in a market that's right here, and let's say you hedge, and the hedge costs five bucks. Well, the next five bucks, let's say the market goes here. So you missed out on that five bucks profits because you blew five bucks on your hedge. Okay. Now what do you do? Now the market's here. Well, do you hedge again? Well, so, okay, let's hedge again. It costs you five bucks. Well, now you gave up the next five bucks, okay? So if you hedge and the market goes higher, then it becomes very expensive because you've got to keep re-hedging along the way. Well, what if you hedge and the market drops? Well, if you hedge and the market drops, then... The market's got to drop at least five bucks before you break even, okay, on that hedge. And then you're going to lose five bucks as it drops, but you're going to make some money on the hedge. So it can become very expensive, and I think in theory it's a beautiful thing. But in theory, theory and practice are the same, and in practice – they are not, and that's where you'll find out a lot, okay? Basically, hedging is a substitute for good stock selection and proper risk management of the stocks in the portfolio. Best to determine the trend and only trade in direction of the trend. Yeah, you know, too many moving parts. And somebody said that a while back in the forum, and um, back when I was I used to be in the TC chat room all day, you know, that kind of died out. I think I was I missed a week, and then all of a sudden it was gone. It's hard to keep those things going. Um, 
And really with my methodology, you don't want to be chatting all day about it. You want to be off doing some research or saving lives or working on projects or something. You don't want to be looking and stressing over the markets all day. But somebody said, too many moving parts. And that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like, I don't want to get too far into this, but you, know, you got a stock and then you sell a call up here, but the stock dies. And what do you do? Do you buy back the call? Do you sell a stock? Oh, maybe you buy a put to hedge. You know, you get in a lot of trouble really quick. You're better off doing this. Is is This is all you have to ask yourself about any market you're looking at. Is it going up? Is it going down? Or is it going sideways? Okay. It took me a long time to get to this point. Not, oh, is it the Fibonacci of the alien, of the oscillator, of the bird crap on the wire, the sumo wrestler, the dirty diaper, you know, or baby diaper, or baby the dirty diaper. No. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? Is the market going sideways? If it's going up, you want to be long. If it's going down, you want to be short. And if it's going sideways, you want to sit on your hands. Sit on hands. Okay? I just saved you a couple hundred thousand dollars right there. Okay? So no matter what you do... Try to try to trade with the trend and do this. And trends will exist. Trends will persist. Trends will happen. Maybe not as often as you want. They might not go as far as you want. But they're going to happen. And if you wait around long enough and you're patient enough, you'll get them. Wait for the trend to continue, but some, wait for the trend to continue. But sometimes it's sometimes hard to set it out when the stock is counter trending. Well, you know, we're all going to have to take some heat in this business. So. You have to be willing to take that a little heat. You have to be willing to sit through those consolidations. Um, one thing that I was going to say earlier, but we had such great questions coming in. You know, this bunch is getting smarter because the questions are getting harder and harder. It used to be easy for me to give the show. You know, I'd just get up here and pontificate. Everybody would be like, oh, okay, that's cool, Dave. Thank you. Now it's like, you know, man, I got to. I got to get my A game going because the questions are tough, and and I don't I don't necessarily have answers to all of them. Uh, now, where it used to be a lot easier. But one thing I did want to show you here is notice that this stock really didn't do a whole lot at first, okay? And then it took off. So you have to be willing to sit it out. You also have to be willing to give up some open profits in those drawdowns. And you've seen those charts before where I show, okay, you're up uh, 20%, you're up 10%, you're up 50%, you're up 20%, you're up 100%, you're up 75%. You're up 200% and you cash out at 150. You know, so you just have to be willing to give up some of those open profits because if you quit here, you're never going to get here. Okay, and you're never going to get that top tick anyway. So just forget about it. Kudos on Kite was the first loaf taken at prior high or after purchase where, uh, whatever you know, follow the money management system. It was the however many points were. Um, However many points were used in the stop, uh, I guess it was uh, quite a bit, eight points. So it was 44 with an eight-point stop. That's what it required. Notice that the shares aren't that high. So it was only 250 total shares. Notice this has a much, um, still, you know, percentage-wise a big stop, but point-wise it's not that big. So that was 2,000 shares here. So you do compensate by trading fewer shares. So what? That's still a decent amount of money. It's better than poking the eye. Okay. Dave, what's your thought on whether you could use your utilize your process as sole source of income or better as additional income to present occupation? Well, you know, there's a lot of things I could say about that. First of all, if you're happy with what you're doing, then you don't have to quit your job to do what I'm doing. Okay. So that's the that's the quick answer. The second answer is your big money is not it's not an income producing strategy and and if somebody tells you they have an income producing strategy the first thing i would suggest you do is run okay because if you had a if you had a, a strategy well, i don't want to get i don't want to get i don't want to dig too far into that but cuz there's some there's some scumbags out there and i don't want to get into it but and, and you know my apologies to you if you if you do have, if you do use those terms and you are legitimate, 
but you got to be really careful with something like that. The market, it, and there was a, a Livermore quote, if you go back about two columns, two or three columns or about a week ago, um, there was a Livermore quote I put him a column about uh, the man who expects the market to, to pay his wages just as he, or just to pay him just as he was working for wages. So the problem that I see if you're doing with trend following as a sole source of income when you really need the income is that you're going to be rewarded very nicely at times and then there's going to be times where you're going to have some flat times and those flat times could be fairly long. You might have a year where you don't make much money. So that's where the problem comes in. Now, if you're adequately capitalized, whatever that is, it depends on what you call, uh, it depends on what you need for an income, okay? If you only need 20 grand a year to live and you got a billion dollar account, you know, you're probably going to be okay. But if you need 100 grand to live and you got a 100 grand account, then obviously the numbers change drastically. So even if you have a fantastic year, you know, it's hard to make the math work. So I like to view it as longer term capital growth. And you're taking that, if you need that capital, if you need some of the growth to live off of, you could take that growth and use that, okay? Um, it's very it's very difficult. The problem with when, you, when you're trading as your sole source of income, it's very hard to do the right thing because that position is up. 20 points and you've got a $5,000 profit in it and you've got uh, a $2,000 mortgage and the kids are in college and you've got a $2,000 tuition bill, okay, and you're up $5,000. You're like, well, I need to cash out because I need to pay the mortgage and pay the tuition bill and another $1,000 bill for whatever else. So you have to cash out at a 20-point profit, and then that stock goes on 50 points, 100 points, 200 points. So you have to be in a position to where it's long-term capital growth, and then maybe you take a piece of that out to use for expenses, and you only take that piece every so often. But if you, if you category that market for income, like a paycheck, it's not going to happen. You're going to go those six to eight months where there isn't a trend and then psychological demons are going to start coming in and it's going to get pretty rough. So the more you have, the more capital you have behind you, the easier it is. I've got a client and he says it perfectly. Sing like you don't need the money. Okay, so it, it's a weird thing. If you, if you need that, if you need that money, if you have to take profits out, so you have to have accounts that you cannot touch so you could grow them. And then, like I said, occasionally take some out and be able to use it to cover expenses. So hopefully that made sense. So I would encourage you to stick with your – don't quit your day job as long as you're happy with it. The problem that a lot of people have, and I was guilty too. Now, I got lucky early in my career. I, did, I took a lot of risk, and I, I, those risks paid off. Okay, In hindsight, it could have gone the other way. Okay, I was highly leveraged in some currency trades, some commodity trades early on. And that kind of kind of kept me bumping along early in my career. Uh, but you got to be really careful. If you if you quit your day job and you start staring at that screen all day, you're going to start firing off day trades. You're going to start making a lot of mistakes, and you're going to have to be really careful in what you're doing. All right, boy, a lot of questions stacking up. Options are a substitute for good stock selection. Okay. No, I'd be careful with that. <laughs> how, about an eagle, how about an Iron Eagle Condor option spread while shorting the reverse butterfly calendar? Yeah. A lot of net, some nasty things about the market makers. Hey, they got to make money too, you know. And uh, can't beat them, join them. You know, like opening gap reversals, that's, uh, that's something that they, uh, they provide. So you, you can be on the same side as them with that. Uh, a couple of announcements real quick. Uh, we're running late because the questions are just fantastic. Like I said, this, this bunch is getting tougher and tougher to, uh, 
um, to, <laughs> to teach to. Uh, IPO webinar is, uh, I've gotten a lot of accolades on this. Everyone has been very happy with it. Uh, I don't think I had, there's something I had a return on. I can't remember what it was, but I don't, I think everyone has got the IPO. I rarely have returns on this stuff because people know what they're getting going in. So watch the, watch the webinar. I'm sorry, watch, yeah, watch the free webinar on the IPO co course. Watch the free webinar on the, on the stock course. And if you like what you see, you're gonna love the course. If you don't, then then avoid it. Okay. But either way, you get a hundred, you get a money back guarantee on that. Also, if you get the stock selection course for now, I don't know how long I'm gonna keep doing it. But every time I say I'll do it, somebody asks me to wait another week. Uh, you'll get the service free for an entire year. All right. Let's hop out to the charts, and then I'll try to I'll try to field these questions as I can, because right, we got a ton of questions that are stacking up, and I've ran way too long. My I would apologize, but yeah, it's 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 your fault. You you ask a lot of good questions. All right, two 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 tools, chart display options. All right, all right. Let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's hop out, and we'll take a look at a few sectors. I don't want to hop into. Uh, we'll get you the questions. All right, here's the P's. Okay, S&P 500. We had a bow tie. Technically, we had a bow tie sell signal yesterday or day before, day before, two days ago. Okay, but so far the market is going higher. And like I pointed out in the panel I was on. Uh, I'm not going to ignore the signal, but I'm going to take it within context of what's going on, and I'm going to draw my lines on the chart, and we're just stuck at a range here. And again, if you go all the way back to, what was it, late October, you can see that the market on a net net basis, if I can get there, talk amongst yourselves, really hasn't moved a whole lot since uh, late October in here. In fact, it would only be up last couple days, you'd actually be negative if you uh, looked at this a couple days ago. So I don't want to beat the dead horse and say the market's in the range, but it's in the range. So draw your arrow. So this tells me right here, I need to be selective in what sectors and stocks I'm trading. You'd have to really like the stock, really like the sector, or and of course, really like the setup. NASDAQ doing okay in here. Notice these moving averages have turned back up. Your exponential moving averages will turn very fast. As soon as price moves through them, they will turn and change direction. I learned that from uh, Greg Boris. And that's one reason why the bow ties work really well is because they're pretty fast to catch up with price. Uh, the, the weighting on bow ties, if you get a chance, look at the formula, and you'll see that it has a very, very high front weighting. And that's how a moving average, a exponential moving average is calculated. Uh, Rusty finally getting a bid in here. Uh, Rusty's just been abysmal, sideways at best, sideways shorter term in a year over a year's period of time. It's been sideways. So, you know, you ask the question about income producing. It's kind of hard to produce a lot of income where you're trading a trend in mostly smaller cap issues and what happened for a whole year. Now, if you know you can easily survive a year then by all means, that's the way to go. And I think that the only real money in markets is with capital producing methodologies in order to, to go in and grow that capital, okay? And there are no true income producing strategies. I mean, unless you may be buying bonds or something like that and sitting on them and making a few percent, okay? But there's if you go out and try to sell options, if you go out and try to mean reversion trade, you're going to get clocked. You're going to make money for a couple of years. You're going to feel great, okay, and then you're going to get clocked. And then, you know, unfortunately, bad shit, for lack of a better word, is going to happen to you when you get clocked. You're going to get depressed. You're going to get pretty bummed out. Your lifestyle is going to go in the toilet. You know, it's like it, bad things can happen with that style of trading. To each its own, though. Now, if you can do it and you've got hedges in place and you know how to – 
operate all the moving parts. You can manage the risk that, that God bless you. But I think it's very, very dangerous, okay? All right, see you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for stopping in. The difference between capital and income producing. Well, income producing is like you, you would sell an option at a dollar, and then 30 days later, the option would be at zero, so you made that one dollar on that option and rinse and repeat and you keep doing that. Um, capital is capital gains is that you get into uh, a kite or something like this and you ride out the trend and instead of making one dollar you make uh, many dollars. You make uh, whatever the case is, you know, many, many, many dollars, many points. Instead of making I'm sorry, instead of making one point on the trade, you make twenty or thirty or forty or fifty points or a hundred points, okay? So that's where the real money is. The problem is I can't guarantee you that real money, whereas these people who are promoting something that's income producing can make it look like you just you just put your money down, pick your money up, and you always make money. And that's just not the case. Um, there are some selected areas out here that have been waking up as of late. It's a very mixed market. But I love what I do, and I love because I'm like on a treasure hunt every day. I'm digging and digging and digging, trying to find an opportunity. And if you look hard enough at this particular market, you got defense breaking out to new highs. You got healthcare breaking out to new highs. Drugs, as a general statement, have been really hanging in there and doing fairly well. Now, last couple of days, notwithstanding, we'll kind of pull back a little bit in here, but for the most part, they've been doing fairly well. Some of the subsectors within have been doing okay too at least on a relative strength basis, okay? Now, you can see it lost a little steam in here, so maybe it's time for me to pull in my horns a little bit on the drugs and the biotechs, but for the most part, they've been doing fairly well, and if you dig within the sector, stocks like Kite have been out there lately. In fact, I've seen a few lately that I, I, that I didn't take because we already had enough biotechs working in the portfolio. So there are some pockets of strength that are worth noting out there such as again the biotech, the health services, healthcare plans, etc. Um, energies are kind of bottoming out in here. I think it might be a little bit too early to call a bottom just yet in energies. Okay, we might have, I hate to use the word wave, but we might have another wave down. But just be patient there. Wait for the market to I have a bona fide bottom. Uh, metals and mining look a little bit better as far as bottoming out. You can see they start to bottom out in here and gold and silver I've been a bull on because we've got this bow tie coming off of multi year lows in gold and both silver in here. So both of those are looking pretty good. Um, there are some there's always something to worry about. You back the chart out in the banks. They're having a good day today. I'd like to see them get back up into this wide and loose range. What has me very nervous is if they break down below it, they're gonna have a long ways down. So the bottom line is the market is um, very much um, mixed out there. I'm sorry, I was trying to multiprocess, which scientists have proved you can't do. Uh, are drugs and bios 100% correlated? Not necessarily. Uh, drugs, biotech's a subset of drugs, but drugs could be a lot of different things. Could be delivery, could be generics, could be uh, major drugs. Major drugs are going to act a little bit different than, than other drugs because major drugs become kind of like a big conglomerate type of company whereas a biotech has some excitement and more uh, inefficient type of stocks. Some of your major drugs can be very efficient type of markets. And if they have some major breakthrough, it's, it's so small compared to the, to the overall earnings that the stock remains efficient. Knowing that you can make 50K in the next trade three out of four times back in the day will lead one to lenient about their philosophy and styles, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the problem. You know, that's, boy, I tell you, it's a tough business because when you finally find, you hit something that's really working and you're printing money, it tends to go in your head, go to your head. And, and I, I show this example over and over again. I Some guy came in and the market went through this nice persistent trend and we absolutely printed money. And he, he writes me an email, bravo for your system. Like he thought he found the holy grail. And then he called the exact top of the market. I've showed that chart a thousand times. And then three or four months later, he said he wasn't happy. 
and it wasn't quite he wasn't quite that nice, but let's just you know let's keep it PG thirteen. So, and I did nothing differently than I would normally do. It's just saying, okay, market's trending. Let's put on some stocks. Let's 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 make some money while the hay shines. While the hay shines, make some, make hay while the sun shines, and that's all I did. All right, let's open up for individual stocks, and I'll try to answer some of these questions uh, too. Okay, Heather, uh, anything that's on the Landry list is off uh, is off limits. Okay, um, QRVO. Um, well, there's nothing. This is a uh, not a conglomerate, but um, is it this like a company? A couple of uh, companies that emerge together. So it's not. I'm not sure it's going to act like a true IPO. Um, but there's nothing to do here until it starts making new highs and then maybe pulls back or something. Okay. Why not buy puts to protect your kite for the next three months and avoid being nicked out of your position? Well, uh, you can, but again, that costs money. And then uh, there's options. You know, look at your H your HV is 91 now. It's approaching 100. What's the IV going to be? Anybody can tell me what the IV in these options are going to be? Out of the money options or put options or whatever. Um, it's going to cost you a lot of money to do that. And, and, you know, then it gets complicated. You put stock in value, stock goes down in value, your, your options are decaying. Oh. <laughs> Draw a trend line of Kai joining the October, December lows on the chart. October, December lows on the chart. Uh, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, this thing has already accelerated higher, so I wouldn't I wouldn't be looking at those uh, trend lines. I'd be more excited about this this higher. I mean, if the HE wasn't so, if this stock hasn't gone expanded so much volatility, I think it'd be a wonderful new trade. But I think it's dangerous at this juncture. ZIOP too much of a gap? Question mark. ZIOP. Uh, yeah, a little bit extreme on the gap. I mean, that's a fifty percent gap. Okay. Uh, mind the gap, as they say over in England. HMY, that's a gold company. Uh, well, it's not set up, but yeah, I hear you. It certainly has bottomed out and rallied nicely. Uh, we're long sand, which hasn't really um, materialized as much as I want it to yet. Um, but it still looks pretty good. You can see you get a nice little bow tie off of all time lows. The problem with commodity-related stocks is, like we talked about at nauseam last week, they're going to be more efficient. I didn't know they were on the Landry list. Yeah, look at your list. You, you have the Landry list. That's okay. I'm not beating you up. It's okay. It's just if I talk, like somebody, uh, one of my clients emailed me, and three out of four stocks that he asked about were on the Landry list, and it's like if I pull those up, then, then it's, it's not fair to my clients who are paying a lot of money uh, for that. Okay, Ruslan says, I hope I get your name right. A D M P T K O and run for one month. Okay, let's take a look at that. A D M P. Okay, T K O and run for one month. Uh, before some resistance from October 2014 at E G R X 11 month IPO at first day and same time. Nice pullback. Your methodology. Thank you. Oh, okay. You're welcome. Um, e G R X. Gotcha. All right. Yes, uh, John's asking the hypothetical portfolio similar to actual portfolio. Uh, the Landry list is similar to my actual portfolio, but yeah, if I'm trading, if I'm, I'm not going to recommend anything that I wouldn't trade. I might take something that's a little bit riskier, uh, that doesn't fit the core methodology, like an MPG. Uh, AGRX is is one that comes to mind too. Uh, from this was from the IPO course, or right around the IPO course time, if I could find it. A G A G R X. Um, so I might go in occasionally trade a thinner stock like this, like this one here when it broke out, okay? And that that's not going to make it to the core service because it's a thinner stock, but I am following the methodology. And then the Landry list, which I can't show you today's, but it's going to be. Uh, let's look at an old one. Uh, it's going to be my actual call list, okay, except for a few thinner stocks, like this GDXJ is uh, something that I was very interested in about a week ago. You can see we had a bow tie here, and it's headed higher. Uh, these gold stocks in here, okay. So 
this is a list I, I either trade personally or will trade personally. You're not going to see anything in this list that I wouldn't personally take. Um, sometimes it might be something that I'm not completely crazy about, but I'll point that out uh, to you, okay? Uh, yeah, Heather, if you when you watch the um, – you never got it, or you know, you got it like don't understand, or you never get it. Um, when you when I do the service, I show you the Landry list, and that's my call list for the next day, my personal call list. And again, you'll I will have a few stocks I put off to the side that don't necessarily um, fit fit the core methodology with the volume or whatever, or they might be a little bit too risky to to, um, to put out there. Okay. You teach a lot of good stuff. That is reason for good questions. Genuine thanks. Oh, you're welcome, Howard. Okay. I mean, I, I really think that this is the best I've ever found. I've been around the block a few times. Um, you're not gonna get rich overnight, and that's why I caution everyone to, to try not to, to see it as a as, like I said, income producing. But longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised if you stick with it. If you just stick with trend following in general, longer term, you'll be uh, uh, pleasantly surprised. RC says, when you say push, it's like billions of shares in a second and selling them the same day. When you say push, it's like buying a millions of shares. I don't understand what you mean. Can you rephrase? Please get into it. I forgot what I'm getting into. Okay, Dave, I am an options guy here. Is there any options approach you like? Is there any safety to be had? Well, you know, I think you should be – if you're an options guy, be an options guy. Um, the only thing I would say with options is to – the, to the newbie is maybe look at options as a substitution for stock. Um, if you go in and you, you trade a stock, if you could get a, an in-the-money option that doesn't have too much fluff on it, too much extrinsic value, then buy the option as opposed to the stock. That's about the only – advice I should I should give I should be careful giving any options advice because I think options look great on the surface but the reality is uh, they're very very tricky um, the other thing that I that I've done in the past I haven't done it much recently but I think that it's 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 something that's that's kind of fun to do I don't you know it's like I have to separate fun and action from my trading because if you trade properly, it's actually quite boring. If I want fun in action, you know, I'll go to I'll go I'll go to the coast and play a three dollar craps table, have a pretty girl on my arm, and have pretty girls bring me drinks. Um, you know, that's action. That's kind of fun. You know, and uh, it was my anniversary, so I knew no matter what happened, I was still going to be lucky. I'll get lucky, right? Okay, so um, <laughs> celebrating my anniversary at least. That was a joke. Uh, hedge funds manipulated by buying a lot of shares until they quickly when you were talking about smart money watching pullbacks. Yeah, maybe that – I don't know if that's going on or not. The good news is by – you know, somebody asked a very good question earlier. They said, Dave, how have you adjusted the volatility? Are you seeing the volatility has changed or what's going on? What I have done is I have loosened up my stops and I have loosened up my entries. And I've also tried to stop dropping F-bombs every time a stock goes – a little bit against me, for or against me, okay? I knew with this kite, this thing, especially if it begins to work, is going to have adverse moves, both and positive moves. So when it's up 10 points in one day, I can't run around, jump up and down, and say, Big Dave, smartest guy in the world. And when it's down 10 points, I can't get all depressed and say, oh, it's down 10 points. I know the nature of the beast. Now, that's kind of an extreme example. There's probably not a whole lot of uh, that hedge fund fun and games going on there. But as a general statement, the market has become choppier, and these funds can push it around quite a bit, can push the market around quite a bit. So what I have to do is I learn to just embrace that volatility and live with it. If a market is going to trend, it's going to trend. Now, a hedge fund might whack it here and there. A hedge fund might actually help to get that trend started. So you just have to live with the volatility and not worry about if there's any manipulation out there. Is there manipulation out there? Of course there is, okay? But live with it, embrace it, 
and make it your friend and realize you're going to have some choppy moves along the way. I had a guy a while back. I talk about it all the time. He would send me like email after email to a point where sometimes four and five pages long. I couldn't read them all because he was telling me how markets were manipulated. Well, so what? Einstein, they are manipulated. <laughs> you know, you don't think there's a lot of big funds out there to play, have fun and games? You don't think a market maker's out there fun and games? You know, they're trying to screw you, but what you could do is you could say, well, I'm not going to get caught up in every little tick. I'm going to give this market enough room and to, to hopefully ride out that longer-term trend. And you know what? I'm going to take some profits along the way. I'm going to trail that stop along the way. I'm going to widen that stop out to hopefully ride out a longer-term trend. I'm going to do all these things and let the fun and games happen somewhere in between. No one is bigger than the market longer term. And if you get down to that minutia and you're trying to, to day trade or even sometimes you're trying to swing trade or whatever, and that's all you're doing is focusing on that minutia, then all this manipulation will have its toll on you, and all this manipulation will probably have an adverse effect on your account. If you're day trading and you're only making X amount of money because that's, that's all the market can move in one day, and some of this manipulation comes in, and all of a sudden you lose 10X, well, it's going to take you a long time to make that money back. Whereas that same move on a longer-term chart that you're riding out might just be a little bit of a blip, and you know you're going to have some drawdown. It just comes to the territory. So to each its own, but you're going to get caught up in a lot more manipulation if you're shorter-term trading. Uh, is the trade in your actual portfolio riskier? Was the trade criteria is different? Um, they're riskier. Not all of them. A lot of them are the same, but the, but some are riskier in that they're thinner stocks. But it's the same. It's the exact same methodology. It's the exact exact same money management. It's the exact same scaling out. It's the exact same trailing of stops. It's just that if I put an AGRX in the service which is a, a thinner stock. Is it AGRX? Yeah, I mean, if I put this in a service, so it, it's going to be hard to, to, to go out and, um, it, you know, it's going to be hard for everyone to trade this one thinner stock. Now, I'm not just trading these thinner stocks. I'm trading the kites and things like that, too, that have more volume, okay? But, yeah, as a private trader, if you know the methodology, I mean, if you have the IPO course, like someone someone went back, and, the stock selection course has an IPO characteristic to it. And that's why those people who initially bought the stock selection course, I let them come to the IPO course. But the IQ, IPO course grew into a much bigger piece than just a one little piece of covered stock selection. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is one of the patterns I covered in stock selection course is from the IPO course. And uh, one of my clients and I, we both went out uh, independently. We both traded this one stock because we saw the pattern setting up. So the point is, the point I'm trying to make, and believe me, I have one. I'm just kind of rushing because we're, we're out of time. But the point I'm trying to make is that the methodology is the same. The money management is the same. The only difference is these stocks, some of these stocks are going to be a little bit more volatile but the main probably thing is that they might be a little thinner and on. As a private trader, I can go in and trade them, but I can't put out a post to where um, everybody can come in and trade the thinner ones. But that's okay. That's the one advantage we have over the big, the big guys and the manipulation and all those guys. They're not going to come in and mess around with some of these smaller IPO stocks. They just can't get enough shares off to make it worth their while. They're going to go buck around with some of these other stocks that are a lot bigger in cat, okay? Whew, Chief Wallman really wound up today. All right, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up soon. Let's take a few more. AQXP. AQ. AQXP. Um, it's kind of strange looking in that, the way it kind of creeped up in here and then had this knockout move. Uh, it looks okay. I think it's, um, well, this is too thin to trade. Now, here's an example of something that's too thin to trade. Uh, but it has bow tied down. I think it's bottomed out. But I don't like the way it kind of crawled up and then had the knockout move. I'd let it break out to new highs. In fact, this is kind of extremely um, thin, so I'd be really careful on that. that now, after we just got talk, through talking about uh, thinner stocks. Nice show, Dave. Cure. Q-U-R-E. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. It's biotech. Uh, 100,000 shares. A little on the thin side, but that's okay. Uh, it looks like it's kind of already triggered in here. 
Yeah, it still could. It looks like it still could work, though. I think that's a pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. I mean, it's, it has had a pretty good run already, and the HV has expanded in here fairly substantially. So it is it is fairly high in HV, but it looks like it might uh, still have potential. So I agree with you on that. Arsity VBLT. That's going to be thin. VBLT. Uh, yeah, it's another biotech, kind of thin, newer issue. Uh, on a pullback, maybe, but it's uh, it's 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 really uh, on the thin side. Like that AGRX was thin, but at the time, I didn't know how thin it was going to be because it was still a new issue. And if you look at some of the volume back here, it had two or three hundred thousand shares a day, or at least a hundred thousand shares. Okay, uh, and when it took off, it still had decent volume in it. Whereas that one is a little bit more established issue, and now we know it only has 20,000 shares a day, so that's that's crazy thin, okay? So you probably wouldn't see a stock like that in my personal uh, portfolio. All right, see you. Okay, ALK, -okay, Alaska Airlines. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the airlines, but hey, you know, I can't argue with the fact that it's going up. Uh, you know, the only problem is when you see an airline way up here, one has to wonder if it's priced for, for perfection. But on a pullback, yeah, absolutely. I think it could probably work. But again, you know, just with a, an airline, you have to wonder once they've gone that far, um, is it done? I found the second found that the second loaf at 20 EMA captures most of the momentum. 20 points in five days is a lot. How does eight points stop wide to 20 point stop? How does an eight point stop wide to 20 point? Well, uh, if the stock is moving uh, 10 points in a day, then that stop could easily widen out, okay? Uh, that's a 10-point move. That's uh, That right there is another 8-point uh, move. I mean, these are, you know, so it could easily – widen out that's a seven point move right there so the volatility has just gone through the roof which is great because it's in the direction of the trend but if you're getting seven eight nine ten points a day that are favorable then you know you're going to have uh, an unfavorable move at some point in time so in order to ride that unfavorable move out to hopefully ride that correction out okay now, this one didn't work perfectly, obviously, because it, it, it technically it stopped out. But let's say that we did ride this correction out, it didn't stop out, and then it goes on to double. It's like it makes a wonderful example of letting that stop wide out. Now, that's what it calls for, okay? It's like the argument I got, the big argument over in San Fran a couple of years ago. I'm always talking about this. One guy's like, but this popular method claims it's 8% stop. You know, it's like... You can't use an 8% stop in a stock like this that trades 8% in, in 10 minutes. That's like saying we all should wear a medium-sized shirt, okay? I haven't worn medium-sized shirts since I was 6 years old. 16% uh, in one day. You mean you're going to go out and trade an 8% stop on a stock like this? No, because you're gonna, you, I could 99.99% guarantee you're going to get stopped out. On a stock like that, with a with an eight percent fixed stop, so you have to adjust to the nature of the market. If a market is bouncing around five and ten and fifteen points a day, then guess what? Your stop is going to have to be outside of that range. If you've got a two point stop, you're going to get stopped out. So, by letting that stop widen out to adjust the volatility, hopefully, in this case, guess what? Hope didn't work. You know, hope in one hand, and you know the rest. But hopefully. You ride out this big correction that you know is going to come sooner or later, and then it keeps on going. Okay? We're out of time. Uh, great questions. Boy, it's getting a tough bunch, but good. I'm excited. You know, that's one of the, the things is like uh, in this business is like you, you know, you want to get to that more uh, advanced concept and all. You want to stop trying to, you don't want to stop halfway through a presentation and explain what a moving average is. You know, it's like that kind of. That's the tough part of this, uh, the educational side. You want to feel like you're growing with everyone. And, and, and gosh, what, what great questions, what tough questions today. So 
Um, I appreciate that and agree. And again, it's not my way or highway, so I know not everybody's going to agree. But I like to see my stuff with with if if somebody doesn't agree with it, I like to see it as a la carte because I, I do think that there are pieces that you could use to uh, if you if you're already successful to make your stuff even better. But anyway. Uh, thank y'all guys so much for being here and girls. Uh, I just have a blast doing these things. So as long as you guys continue to show up, I will continue to do them. So thank you so much. We don't talk yet. Everybody have a great weekend. I know we've got a lot of unanswered questions. Shoot me an email and I will personally uh, reply to you. And, uh, and if not, uh, if you want to wait till next week, be happy to, uh, use it as a fodder for fodder fodder for next week's show. And again, everybody have a great weekend. We'll talk again, uh, I guess next week if that's what it. Thank you so much.